How does God do that? Many Christians assume it just happens. They would be mistaken. Previously, in our two lessons together, we have focused on praising God for his work, his work in saving us. And we focused how it begins there at baptism. We had great studies and great comments that we heard from you on this. But presently, today, we are still praising God, focusing on his work <laughs> in sculpting us every day. How does God develop me? How does God sculpt me into his son's image to reflect it more every day? Today's lesson builds on the premise of our life's very purpose that we've been in uh, the first two and a half months now of this year already. That is, as defined and described in Ephesians 2, 10, and in this case, Romans 8, 29, we are God's workmanship created, recreated in Christ to ever increasingly reflect his light and resemble his appearance the appearance of Christ in all of our conduct by doing all of the work that God has prepared for us to do every day. Um, tying in our previous two lessons together into this and preparing us for today. The new life does begin at baptism, scripturally speaking, where God does his saving work. God rewarded our faith response, our faith-driven, obedient response to the gospel by forgiving us of our past, by freeing us to pursue the life of righteousness, freeing us from the debt of sin and its consequence of death. He rewarded our faith response by renewing us by his spirit power of truth and resurrected us by his life-giving spirit. This is incredible. All of this then continually cleanses and equips us, as Philippians 2 describes, to live out our saved life. Hold on to it. God deserves no less. We give him our best out of love. So to transition to today, the Christian life is one of commitment. I know we know this, but scriptural baptism is a one-time response which must begin a maturing lifetime of rewarding responsibilities. God did not save you from a life of sin or a condition of sin for you to then continue pursuing the way of death. Now, we're not perfect, but we're not pursuing unrighteousness. The Christian's motto initially is, yes, come as you are. That, you know, that phrase, just as I am, that wonderful song that has 25 stanzas. Just kidding. That just as I am. Yes, God welcomes you just as you are. But that stops short of the Christian message. You are never to leave or continue just as you were. God's marvelous grace demands more than that. God's mercy and grace has allowed you to continually be justified, redeemed, and restored, forgiven. And that which behooves us, it compels us to give him our all out of a heart of love to pursue righteousness. Today, with all the things that we will be addressing, a lot of doctrinal points that intersect. I love that song and all of the ones that we've sung already today and many more. I love that phrase as well, let him have his way with thee. What does that mean, let him have his way with thee? Do we just sit back and let God chisel and do nothing? To, to be the best Christian that we can possibly be, we know that we must keep a humble heart. That could be a sermon point. That we must live a faithful life. That could be a sermon point. But even if our hearts are right and we're desiring to be godly, we still may ask, how do we best help God in the sculpting process? We know we will gradually grow as we do right things. And, but yet specifically, how does God work on me? What should I do? What should I observe to not hinder the process? Many people are shortchanging God by simply doing what they want when they want, however they want. The question that I just posed about what should we observe and do to help God in the sculpting process, that implies work, discipline. Too many Christians live by a mistaken concept. Many people believe that Christian maturity just happens merely with the passing of time. That's not right. They would be mistaken. 
If you want to get into shape with any particular sport, to be conditioned for that sport, you would hire the best coach, the best trainer, and a good instructor will instruct. He will keep you active at the right time and to the right length and rest for the right length of time. And then to keep you busy doing things that are not always comfortable, right? He would not be a good trainer if he were to say something like this. Sit in your chair, sit in your beanbag chair all day, eat whatever you want, don't move too much, eat however much you want, and you know what? I'll even do the exercises for you. That sounds good. But that, that will not promote healthy living in any way. <laughs> a good coach will instruct. A good coach will support, counsel, and guide you at every step. God does this. But how does he do this? So how does God develop us? How does God sculpt us into his image? What are God's chisels? We could talk so much about each of these points, but I, I just want us to praise God for how he uses the things that he uses. And then think about these on your own time. Um, chisel tool number one, God uses his word. God uses his word concerning all of creation. Here's some interesting points, uh, some meaty points for those of you who just love to think this way. Hebrews 11.3 explains the universe and talks some things about how it was created. And, and it was created by the wisdom and power of the spoken word, right? Essentially, God just thought it and boom, here it is. But the power and the wisdom of the spoken word. It's no surprise, but it is fascinating to associate Ephesians 2, 8 through 10 to Hebrews 11. It describes the redeemed as God's workmanship, his new creation, creation in us, in Christ. We are a work in progress. We are daily being developed by what? The power of truth in his spoken word. Interesting, all of creation exists by the power of God's spoken word and we are recreated and developed by the power of the spoken word. Hope you enjoyed that. I was fascinated to come across those two verses. First Peter chapter one, verse 23, speaks of us being born again by obedience through the spoken word. Yes, the written word. And then first Thessalonians confirms this or affirmed by according to chapter two, verse 13. This is the same word that continues to work on and in us. This is continuing to work on each of our lives and based on our yielding to it. Some people approach the scriptures with like, uh, like it's their tool to uh, work on others. That happens, but it's more precise to say as a foundation, it's God's tool to work on me. It's God's tool to work on me. Practically, how does that work? We have to surrender to it. God's word works on those who surrender to it. But how does that happen? We could have a whole series of this, but. Essentially, God's word benefits us by giving us exactly the instruction that we need. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, we know it well, but what does this mean? Let's break it down in, into points that we relate to. It teaches us that God's inspired and written word gives us what we need to mature by teaching. We need to be taught by reproving. We need to be corrected. And that's what's next, correction, slightly guiding and adjusting balance. We also need to be trained in righteousness. The nature of a divine book to say this is all you need. Incredible. And I want you to imagine all the books in the world just disappearing except for everyone's copy of the Bible. No problem. It's all we need. Then why do we have books? You know, I held up this devotional book just a second ago. I'll make sure to keep that hid. I don't want people to think we do anything but this right here. A book is a one-way conversation in print. And we're all learning. More on that in point three, obviously. But... But a book is conversation in print. I want to learn from others. But, but the inspired word is from God. I need to learn from him. And he's given us everything we need to pursue righteousness. The right truth to think. The right advice to take. The right words to speak. And the right path to follow. I want you to think of two individuals in this hypothetical situation. Two individuals with virtually identical circumstances and personalities. But... I, more often than not, <laughs> the blessing of perspective and peace will go, and sometimes even the preferred outcome, will go to the one 
who's aware of God's will and seeks God's will in the matter. And even if the outcome isn't preferable or desirable, the blessing of knowing truth is desirable above all. I think about Psalm 119, starting with verse 104. We often go to verse 105, but mm -mm. let's read the verse before, during, and after this, the one that we're used to. Psalm 19, 119, 104. Through your precepts, I get understanding. Don't listen to the world. They're full of confusion. That's evident every day. Through your precepts, I get understanding. Therefore, I hate, abhor every false way. I don't want to be deceived. I want to know the truth. 105, your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. And then the next verse, I have therefore sworn and confirmed that I will keep your righteous judgments. Such a powerful passage. God's word is the chisel and we yield to this. Why else would we do anything but listen to that word? This is the heart, by the way, that embraces the spirit of Jesus' prayer in John 17, 17. Referenced, I believe, in class and, and implied anyway. Uh, sanctify them. In truth, thy word is truth. As the word develops us into holy thinking and righteous living, we are increasingly set apart from the sinful world. Now that says a lot right there. Not only does it sanctify us, help us pursue the life of righteousness, we're still living physically in this world and that's not easy. So the word does something else. The word arms us to maintain holy living against the powerful, unrighteous opposition. Ephesians 6. Ephesians 6 is a passage I love so much. I don't often preach on it because I don't want to do it an injustice. But I love the verses. We will read. If you want to go ahead and turn to Ephesians 6, we'll read beginning at verses 13 and following. I, it talks about being completely suited up in God's armor. I used to hear these words and think, okay, God is giving you armor, which is a glorious thought in and of itself. I wouldn't want to wear any other armor but from the one who created me for me. But consider this as I read these words. He provides us with the very armor of his nature, which he uses against evil, which has no chance against him. It's God's armor. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. Stand, therefore, having girded your waist with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness and having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, take the shield of faith with which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. This is the tool that the Spirit uses. Carefully crafted phrase, this is the tool the Spirit certainly uses as he matures our soul from within as it has described to us. As we become more skilled in the use of God's word, it works to enable us to stand against the attacks of the devil. Not even his lies will damage you. You won't be offset. You won't be um, deceived. Your soul will be preserved, protected by the truth that's working in you. God's chiseling it away to make you a more formidable opponent to the devil as well by truth, his truth. This is the tool. The scriptures. How can we help God work on us with his chisel of the word? I, I, I think I used this book to uh, beat my head earlier. Hope it didn't look that bad. But that's probably where I got this. I would love to just set the book on top of my head and, and by osmosis, I guess, just all that information just go into my brain. It doesn't work that way. Commit to spending steadfast time with the scriptures. Be under the, the bevel and the cutting edge. The more quality time we are under the cutting edge of the chisel 
of God's word, the more improved our image will be to reflect his glory. So read it. But don't just read it. Study it. Don't just study it. Put it into practice. Let it change you. This is one way to help him make you into the sculpted masterpiece that he wants you to be. Obvious points. Let's go to the next point. Totally shifts and many complex points that I, I hope I don't uh, say anything I shouldn't and not say what I ne uh, needed to. The next point of God's chisel, he does use his people. It's right for us to pray as we have already done. God help those in need. Humans have a lot of needs and on deep levels and in ways that only he knows best and God's not limited by human resource. So it's right for us to pray, God help them. We are a created being, a recreated being in Christ, equipped with the resources for the good works that God has prepared for us. Like mind blown application here, what are we saying? Don't fool ourselves. So often we are to be the vessels through which those needs can and must be met. That's God's design and it blesses everyone. Ephesians 1 verses 22 and 23 are common as we talk about the church. It doesn't just say the church is like this or like that. This is one passage that tells you what it is. It defines God's church, Christ's church, as his body. One of the first lessons I presented here at the summer series spoke a whole sermon on just this. We are members of one another. Uh, and as his body, he is the head. He directs, he guides, he leads. But we are his hands, his feet, his back, his arms, his legs. This has many implications. Who Think about this one. Christ's ministry on earth is continued and accomplished in us. Wow, that's a mission. That's incredible. We are a continuing incarnation of Christ's mission in that sense, aren't we? But to a further glory, as the world looks upon his body, think of this. Each member of the body is a resource for fellow members to be sustained and strengthened. That is powerful. To let this chisel work most effectively, we must all commit to our effective work. And as we have opportunity, which is all the time. Illustration point. Heard this many years ago. Sometimes an illustration says a lot more than just uh, dialogue or sermon content. In an era past, there was uh, the story told of a doctor who was vacationing. He traveled by train many miles. The train derailed wrecked. He was one of several who incurred only minor injuries. Many others suffered severe and fatal wounds. A reporter eventually on the scene got to him but could overhear. The reporter eventually approached this doctor and said, I heard you saying something to yourself over and over and over and over again. What, what were you saying? He, he, doctor straightened up and said, I'm sorry, let me um, introduce myself. I, my name is Doctor, and he gave his name. I couldn't help but think, as I look around, if I only had my instruments. If I only had my instruments, I could alleviate much of the suffering around me. I, I imagine God looking down and around at his created and redeemed children on earth. And while seeing the physical needs and the spiritual suffering of so many, disheartened by our own apathy and or disobedience, asks himself, God asking himself, where are my instruments? Capability is nothing without availability and willingness to enact. Are we an available, willing, and functional instrument to serve God by serving others to his glory? Uh, a lifestyle. I think about lifestyles that just don't serve others, uh, do not honor God. Such a person could think, I haven't sinned today. I haven't done anything. 
If that's a lifestyle, that's the problem. That could be bad. Scriptures command each of us to serve one another in the ways that we've been gifted. In the last winter quarter, we had a whole class or two on just this, and they're uploaded for you to see. Check that out on the Jerusalem blueprint of how we serve one another. Think of the beauty of this way of God. It's not just ideal. It's a command for us to experience it as reality. Each of us, each member serving to meet other members' needs result in every member's needs being met. As each member is serving to meet another's needs, every member uh, has its, his or her needs met. That's beautiful. Absolutely beautiful. God has given us each other to meet each other's needs. 1 Corinthians 12 is a bonus verse, and it summarizes the rest that haven't been mentioned. I, I just want you to uh, let me take another dynamic of this discussion. I can't ignore it. The body membership mindset is interdependent involvement. And there are many songs that capture this. One we sung earlier, A Common Love. I like the other one, God's Family. We sing it often here. It's so simple and yet so, so strong. I want to read these lyrics. We are part of the family that's been born again. Part of the family whose love knows no end. For Jesus has saved us, made us his own. We're part of the family that's on its way home. Sometimes we laugh to together, sometimes we cry. Sometimes we share together heartaches and sighs. When a brother meets sorrow, we all feel his grief. When he's passed through the valley, we all feel relief. Together in sunshine and rain and in victory through his precious name, Sometimes we dream together of how it will be when we all get to heaven, God's family. Humans have many needs, many needs. And we are each learning as we grow in our own ways. And that's a resource to be blessed by. For the next few moments, just a minute or two, we, you don't hear sermons on this much, but I have to address some things that will bring up memories and, and will maybe help some of you. I, I almost hesitated sharing what I'm about to. But for some of you who will tell me afterwards, I really appreciate what you said. I'm going to share it for the benefit of all. Concerning spiritual growth. Words to be shared. Concerning spiritual growth, we help one another. God's chisel of his people is to work and for it to work most effectively there are two dynamics that must be in place as a foundation we assume that we want to grow so then the two things are receiving and giving counsel sub point one let others work on you uh, if there are questions to determine if you struggle with pride seriously struggle this might be at the top of the list do you prefer to only give instruction but not receive it are you that type of person it's easier to give than to receive in this respect a few points i'm not going to overlook talked them out just right huge disclaimer I know it's easier to accept counsel from someone who you know cares about you, and it's perceived as a loved field warning by a family member who sees danger in your path and does not want you to fall on your spiritual walk. How much harder is it then for you to receive worthy rebuke, reproof, when you know it's good advice, but from someone whose heart is apparently arrogant and whose mind ignorant and does not know the pain caused? Satan has his tools, and sometimes you can find them listed in a church directory. Sometimes it's the brethren who don't know how they initially caused the hurt. And again, in context of spiritual instruction, Satan works to have us not listen to his word. How does this happen? Some people who are maybe adamant to espouse a truth are not always mature in Christ's love when sharing it. Good souls become wounded and calloused to receiving the instruction of God's word. That's how serious it is. This is a consequence of not sharing considerately. I call, you call, I call them Bible thumpers. You may call them something else, people who beat others with the book. In the name of good, they do more harm than they will ever learn before the Lord's return. 
I implore you, forgetting all the details then, I implore you to keep your heart right by receiving all good advice. Receiving that, regardless of the uh, condition of the heart, sharing it, because your love, your compassion, your de uh, desire for fellowship and showing of respect will eventually lead to, as David said, the unity desired. These are keys to being the type of person who welcomes godly counsel and for being pretty good at sharing it too, where others are happy when they hear you. The more you let God use others to work on you, the more effective you become at working on improving others. We must then uh, help each other by humbly receiving and lovingly sharing on your own time, let the outline preach the rest of the sermon to you. Hebrews 10, Matthew 18, Galatians 6, and James chapter 5. Each of us are God's chisels that God uses to shape us into who he wants us to be. Let's make sure we're letting the word shape us to be that effectively. Chisel tool number three, briefly mentioned, his providential care. Providence is one of those things that you see it the longer you live it. God's foreseeing care and guardianship over his people. God provides it's not just on automatic, let's see what happens. Let's see what he planned to happen. No, God provides. His providence is more clearly seen the longer we live. And through difficult circumstances, we always trust. And when things turn out and we get past that storm, we look back and we say, wow. We praise God for how he did it. That's usually where we say the phrase, God works in mysterious ways. <laughs> Through the positive reinforcement of rewards following his will, that motivates us to serve him more. Through the hard times, we learn to trust him and lean upon him, and that strengthens our faith. God knows just how much we can take, gives us a little bit more, and then shows us how he takes care of it. That's why we depend on him. It's not us. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 6 and 7. Apply this in your prayers. Don't just ask God to alleviate your suffering, but in this case, pray also that he helps you remain steadfast and to endure because you want to be complete. You want to be wholly equipped. You want to look like what God wants you to look. Allow yourself to be under his chisel. 2 Corinthians 12 is an example of Paul's thorn in the flesh. Satan wanted to hinder Paul with it, but God worked to bless Christians from that point forward and even himself. As we face disciplines of life, we can face everything with meaning and purpose. And here's the key. I can face anything knowing that God is working on us all the time. Some of the greatest spiritual blessings that enhance my day are from the, some of the hardest trials I've ever gone through. And I believe you can relate to that as well. In conclusion, how well are we helping God work on us? If we are God's workmanship, we are letting him use the chisels to shape us. We immerse ourselves in God's word. We surround ourselves with God's people and we purposefully experience his providence so that people see more of him in us every day. I hope to encourage you to let God use his chisels on you. Don't shortchange God by pushing one of his resources away. Mentioned last time together that the initial recreation happens there at baptism. That's where God begins his work. Don't let it stop. God's sculpting process continues every day. If there's anything amiss in your life, or if you're not even in Christ, let's make it happen. We'll pray for you as we stand.